Well, good morning everyone. My name is Dr Peter French and I am a Senior Lecturer in Coastal Management in the Jockery Department at War Holloway. What I want to do today is to pre present you some ideas about coastal management, some looking into the issues that are typically faced along a coastline which is defended but the implications of those defended might, of those defences might not be readily obvious. The talk is going to be based on a case study, and that case study is from Fairlight Cove, which is a village on top of a cliff just to the east of Hastings in East Sussex. The information I should be presenting is linked to some research that a student of mine carried out back in 2011. So, OK, a bit of background. You see here the image on the right hand side is the village of Fairlight. <coughs> just to the east of Hastings in East Sussex. Erosion here has been going on for some considerable time and rates have reached up to 1.14 metres a year, which in terms of coastal erosion can be quite significant considering the proximity of those houses on the cliff edge. Typically, we see erosion in the form of slumping where the sea undermines the base of the cliff and then large sections of material slump onto the beach and take with it quite considerable areas of the land behind. But ironically, of course, when we have a land slip like this, um, the landscape itself performs a degree of protection to the cliff edge, because rather than erode the, the base of the cliff, the sea will then start to erode the fall of material. So typically, after we have a, a slip episode, we actually have an area, a, a period of time where no further erosion occurs because the sea is actually eroding the material which has fallen. What is the problem at Fairlight? Well, the problem at Fairlight stems from Hastings. Now, at Hastings, we have a popular tourist resort with a small harbour. And you can see from these two images exactly the, the, the problems which are causing the erosion at Fairlight Cove. The left-hand image there shows the classic sawtooth type pattern in beach shape, which you get when you install a groin field along a coastline. The image on the right is in the harbour area where much larger structures prevent any longshore drift from occurring. And you can see as you go further to the right on this image, the beach gets narrower and narrower to right on the right hand side. There is no beach at all and the foot of the cliff is completely exposed to erosion. So the cause of Fairlight's problems stem from what's happening at Hastings further along the coast. So as those defences were built, the supply of shingle by longshore drift started to decline and ultimately any beach that was at Fairlight was eroded by the sea, leaving the cliffs vulnerable. That erosion has led to property loss, it's led to the loss of roads and ultimately to the loss of utilities as well because often beneath roads we get things like water mains, we get electricity, we get phone cables and we get sewage pipes as well. If nothing was done, by 2060, it is estimated that 55 houses would fall into the sea. This is 55 properties where people live, where people have invested in, and often families have lived for many years. This led to the local population demanding protection. They petitioned the government, they petitioned local authorities, said, look, this is an issue, we have to protect our coastline. Initially, they were turned down. Government refused. The policy along this coastline is no active intervention, that no defences will be built. In terms of cost benefit, it was believed that the cost of building defences and maintaining defences was far in excess of the land and properties which were being protected. So they were turned down. A local person decided to act against this and formed the Fairlight Coastal Preservation Society. This was a an active group that partitioned, that did their own surveys, that consulted um, with companies to come up with alternatives which weren't as expensive, but they believed they could overturn the government's decision and ultimately protect their houses from the sea. That worked, and in early 1990s, the first scheme was approved and construction started. So this is actually very rare in coastal management to see local people overturn a government decision and in effect get houses protected. So why was there this change of heart? Why did the authorities change their heart? It was based on costing 
it was based on modelling. Now, the image here, as you can see, is actually a map of Fairlight, but those lines are predictions of coastal positions every seven years. And you can see, as the coast erodes, the amount of land loss gets significantly more and more, and we start to get what's get this large cove forming. <coughs> as that happened, you can see on the map that actually houses would be lost to the sea, but then you can see that main roads would be affected, and under those main roads were the main utilities. Ultimately, within a relatively short period of time, even the houses that weren't eroded in that village would be uninhabitable because they had no services, no water, no electricity or no phones. Now, what the villagers actually did here was actually map out on this where roads would have to go. Now, clearly, constructing roads is expensive, but it also takes extra land which other people own. But what this diagram actually did, what this mapping exercise actually did, was convince local authorities, convince national government, that with a suitable scheme, protection was necessary in order to protect the town and the whole area as well. So this is what happened in 1990s. This aerial photograph down here, phase one. This was built in order to protect the worst eroding part of the village. Now, initially, the government agreed to this scheme on the understanding that no other construction would take part. However, in 2007, they again overturned that decision and built a second phase where erosion was starting to increase and problems were starting to be felt. Again, in 2007, this scheme was built on the understanding that no other defences will be built. And, as you may expect, 2016, those two initial phases were linked up by a third phase, meaning that most of that coastline now is protected by these rock buns. They are literally just huge boulders, which you may have seen on the coastline, which are piled up in order to stop the coastline eroding. Now, ironically, the coastline has not stopped eroding. It is still eroding, but at a much slower rate. So these have if, if they offset the eventual problems, but in such a way that the area has a much greater longevity. So this image here then shows where those three schemes actually are. So what we have here is a coastline protected by these rock buns. What the government conceded when they approved these plans was that these bonds would be built, but they wouldn't be permanent. They would have a design life of 50 years, after which they would be, if you like, just left, not maintained, and erosion will start to increase again. Now, clearly, in 50 years, we are dealing with sea level rise, so the sea would be higher anyway. We're dealing with increased storminess. One of the consequences of climate change is that many of our oceans are getting stormier which means that waves, when they hit the coastline, are getting bigger, they have more energy, so they are eroding more land. So after 50 years, they will be left to decay. Now, bear in mind, the first one was built in 1990s, and the last one in 2016. So there's a, theoretically, these are going to be abandoned at different times. The long-term policy for this coastline has not changed. It is still no active intervention. So these are a short-term measure to offset erosion in the medium term. So we have a system then where we had active coastal erosion. That erosion has been reduced significantly, which is to the benefit of the people living there. Now, however, the problems at Fairlight are caused by defence structures further along the coastline, which are preventing sediment moving along the coastline. What we have at Fairlight is new defences which are preventing erosion and therefore reducing the amount of sediment which is available in the sediment budget. So let's move on now because we've seen the defences, but there are two sets of consequences here. One is the impact on the natural processes operating on that stretch of coastline. And the second set are the impacts on the people that live on the cliff type, that live in Fairlight. So I'd like to look at those two aspects because they put a wider scope of what coastal management is actually all about. It is not just about identifying a problem, throwing up a sea defence and walking away. It's considering what does that sea defence do to the coastline? What are the other implications? So, okay, 
We can do a bit of maths here, and it's not complicated maths. Let's start with before that first defence was built in the 1990s. The cliff is about 500 metres long. Its average height is about 25 metres, and the erosion rate was 1.14. So every year we have a 500 metre stretch of coastline, 25 metres high, receding in land by 1.14 metres. These are averages. So simple volumetric calculation, 500 times 25 times 1.14, which is the volume of that section of material, indicates that 14,250 cubic metres of sediment every year will enter the coastal sediment budget. Now that's an input to the sediment budget. Post defence. Erosion reduced to 0.36 metres, so from just over one metre to about a third of a metre. That, using the same com com um, calculation but substituting 1.14 for 0.36, gives us 4,500 cubic metres. So we're still getting an input to the sediment budget, but that is significantly reduced. It's reduced by 9,750 cubic metres. So we have to ask the question, is that significant? What does that mean to other places further down drift? Hast um, Fairlight is down drift of Hastings, but what's down drift of Fairlight? Important thing we have to consider. First of all, those volumes are estimates. They are almost certainly overestimates because a cliff is composed of sediment. But between those sediments are air spaces, pore spaces. So that volume we've calculated is the total volume of all the sediment plus pore spaces. It's like if you filled up a bucket of sand right to the top. <clears throat> it may appear full, but you can still, if you pour water into it, that would still soak in. It's filling up the pore spaces. There's always space there. So that's one issue. Grain size. What is the sediment? We're on an open, high energy coastline here. So if the sediment are silts and clays, they're not likely to go towards the formation of beaches. They're going to be moved along the coastline. So the sediment is actually important. Is that sediment that's being input from that cliff erosion contributing to the sediment budget and to beach building, i.e. is it coarse enough? So how much actually is in the sediment budget? Now to determine that, we'd need to go and do some field sampling. We need to look at what sediment is there, do a grain size analysis on it, look what's on the current beaches, and do a calculation as to how much of that material is actually going to stay in circulation. What are the implications for process? How have those defences changed processes? Now, before they were built, ways would enter the, the near shore area, they would expend energy by hitting the coastline and ultimately eroding it. If that energy is sufficient enough, it will cause bits of that coastline to break off. Now what they're doing is hitting the boulders, and the boulders are resisting the waves. But often when we build sea walls, we often tend to observe a process called transfer of energy. Energy, because these waves are not hitting the coastline square on, they're hitting at an angle, by, you know, they're generating the longshore drift. Energy is often deflected further along the coastline. You may well have seen evidence of this if you go to a beach with a sea wall. Often when the tide is out, there is a depression next to the sea wall. Often that stays filled with water, which can make getting to the beach difficult. What's happening there is the energy is hitting the sea wall and almost forming like a spiral, which is traveling along the front of the sea wall parallel to it and scouring out the sediment. At the end of the sea wall, there, are, there is land which can be eroded. That energy would therefore be focused on a different part of the coastline, potentially causing a problem somewhere else. So there are implications, therefore, for process, for sediment transfer, and also for what happens to the energy on that coastline. But the critical point here, erosion is considered a negative aspect of the coastline, because erosion implies loss of land. If that land is used for something, that causes problems. But the very loss of that land generates sediment which contributes to the sediment budget, which builds up beaches and coastal landforms elsewhere. So erosion is not a bad thing. Without erosion, we wouldn't have beaches, we wouldn't have sand dunes, we wouldn't have salt marshes. Erosion is an important aspect of the coastline because it helps maintain coastal form and coastal process elsewhere. <coughs> 
So this is the situation after that first seawall, post 1990s. That original bund reduced erosion. It also refocused it. What? Have a look at this image. On the right hand side, at the end of that bund, is an area of new erosion. You can't spot it, there it is. What is happening here is that Fairlight is now protected in the short to medium term, but a new area of erosion has started. Now, in this case, it's not a main issue because this is not developed land, it's fields. So, it doesn't have as high a value as the land. The critical thing is we have generated a new area of erosion, but it's in an area which is not significant. But this, what we see here, is a classic situation when a sea defence is built. We don't, well, we may stop erosion where the sea wall is, but we often generate new problems elsewhere. And it's important to consider that because what you don't want to do is to solve somebody's problem and cause somebody else a problem. So, OK. What we've seen here is impacts on the seven budget, impacts on process, impacts on erosion. What about people? If you were living in one of those houses, you probably couldn't sell it because it's under risk of erosion. You may lose your house and property at any time in a big storm. You know, just consider how you would feel living on that cliff top when a big storm hits that coastline, particularly if you live near the edge. So what I want to consider here is the people side, because coastal management is not just about managing process, it's about managing the interactions and the relationship between people, the coastline, coastal processes, human functioning, and so on. Now, interestingly, if you were to consider rationally what's happening at Fairlight, evidence of housing loss, the fact that those structures are only there for 50 years, the sale of houses would be negligible, their value would be declining, and people would basically just be abandoning houses. Now, oddly, based on this research which was done, say, in 2011, that is not the case. The graph on the right-hand side, the top one, looks at house sales in East Sussex. The middle one is for Fairlight itself, and the bottom one is for what they call the Fairlight front line, which is the area of Fairlight nearest to the sea. Properties nearest to the sea had a slightly lower value, but there is no main issue here. Indeed, you can see from the line on that graph that in all three areas, there were a few glitches, but the trend is increase in cost. Now, interestingly, at the bottom graph there, you see in 2005, the cost of house or the sale of houses reduced quite significantly. And that was because at that time there was a growing awareness that the central part of that area was eroding quicker because of defences on either side. So people weren't able to sell houses. But you can see from the line actually house prices were still increasing. And again at the right hand side of that bottom you see that line dips in 2009. That was the point at which final construction or construction started actually started on the main areas. So there's a direct correlation here between house price and when defences were approved and when construction started and people began to feel more secure. So there is still demand for houses there. There are still people having building work done on houses. And we appear to buck the trend. Now that doesn't appear logical. Because an area under risk of erosion with defences only for 50 years and then erosion will be allowed to pick up again. Why are people still investing in coastal property? So why are they continuing? <clears throat> well, interestingly, most people who purchase houses and Basically, what happened in this research is that it was determined by using property registers how many or who had bought houses, and these people sent a questionnaire. Most people bought their houses because they went and looked around the area, they liked the village, they could see the area, and they believed that houses were far enough from the cliff edge not to be a problem. They did not 
consult any scientific data. If you look at the cliff line, you see these massive piles of rock. Those piles of rock give you a perception of safety. There's a great big structure there. And typically, people feel safer behind a structure. This is one of the problems with persuading people to have or to utilize soft engineering. A beach feeding, for example. Do you feel as safe behind a pile of sand as you would do behind a concrete seawall? Well, actually, if you look into the, the processes here, they can afford the same degree of protection if they're managed correctly. The shoreline management plan. That clearly states that houses at risk have 100 years before they will be lost. So residents don't believe the houses are going to be lost because in writing it says 100 years. But again, this is a prediction. This is an estimate. Waves, the sea, coastal processes can't read. They don't know that they're not supposed to erode something for 100 years. But it's in writing, it's written by a scientist, therefore people tend to believe it. There is evidence there that one person who recently bought a house had to move out within a couple of years and is now living in a caravan, purely because of a major erosion event put his house a lot closer to the edge. And cliff top house, lovely views of the sea. In fact, on a clear day, you can actually see the, the northern coast of France. So pleasant environment, sea views make houses attractive. And if you look at estate agents details, no estate agent mentioned erosion. Estate agents don't tell people that there's an erosion problem. Indeed, one example looked at, direct uninterrupted views across the English Channel. It makes it sound idyllic, but when you look at that house, its garden is already eroding. Now, this raises an important question. Who is responsible for informing house buyers of risk? Now, if you're buying a house on a floodplain, you could look at the environment agency records and they have flood risk maps. So you can look how often does this area flood? When did this property I'm going to buy flood? There is no equivalent for the coastline. So there is no sort of evidence as such. Should the estate agents be obliged to tell you? Well, the estate agent's role is to sell a property. They're acting on behalf of the seller, not the buyer. So it's not in their interest to point out the bad ones. Should the solicitor who does your house searches say, well, possibly yes, but if that solicitor is not local, they don't know. So it's a complex area. People are buying houses in areas at risk because they don't know what the risks are. And if they do, they choose to ignore them. So why buy a property? One is because you haven't got the information. But another is this denier of a the denial of a problem. Those sea views are far more important than the risk of a, of a bit of erosion. So, in the case of Fairlight, the sea views, the statement from the SMP that we have 100 years of <coughs> safety. A lack of risk awareness. Now, humans are funny creatures. If something, if you've experienced something, your risk awareness of that something becomes much greater. But if you haven't, you're relying on people to tell you. If you've been hit by a car as you cross the road, then next time you cross the road, you'll be much more aware. But if you haven't, then that awareness might not be as great. Desirability to have a sea view. Human nature, so if you want something enough, you're tempted or you're inclined to overlook the negatives of getting that something. So a house with a sea view, lovely. By definition, it's a house with a sea view, so it must be near the sea. Is it likely to flood? Is it likely to, to erode or fall into the sea through erosion? So it can lead to a denial of risk. And this is common in human nature. Lack of information, who is responsible for informing buyers. So a whole range of reasons. But what are the causes of that? Those are the drivers of that. Those are what make people ignore the risk. But why do people ignore the risk? One is understanding. You could say that you could read reports on coastal erosion, you could read the shoreline management plan, you could go to local authorities and look at planning documents and so on, which is fine. But often, and one of the big problems of science is that scientists are not brilliant at communicating to people. They tend to write in a different language. It might as well be Japanese. 
Because if you use scientific language, if you use scientific te technology to describe something, then even if you read it, your chances of actually understanding what it means are greatly reduced, because you just don't understand the language. Lack of available information. 64% of buyers who have bought houses 10 years before the survey was carried out were not told of erosion risk. Nobody mentioned it to them. Not the state agents, not the people selling the house or whatever. That's over half of people had no idea there was an erosion risk there. If you're buying a house sort of 50 metres from the coastline, you may not even have looked over the cliff edge. Not advisable, or even walked on the beach and seen the structures there. But if there is a cliff there, the only way that cliff could have formed is through coastal erosion. There's no other way a cliff can form. There's also, it's quite interesting, that if there is a problem in the future, the local authorities, the environment agency, will always repair the defences. They'll always reinforce the defences, they'll always upgrade them. 71% believe the government had a duty to protect them. 55% would expect compensation if they don't. The building of coastal defences is not a statutory right. If your house is eroding, there is no legal requirement to protect it. Or even if your house is protected, there is no legal requirement to continue that protection at the end of that design life. And there is certainly no legal obligation to give compensation. In cases the government does, but it's not necessarily an obligation to do so. So what have we seen as we draw this to an end? We have seen that cliff erosion is a key issue. It's driven by a range of processes. Many of those processes are natural, but some are enhanced by human activity. The building of defences elsewhere along the coastline, particularly defences that stop sediment movement, i.e. groins, jetties and so on. In problems of erosion, we build defences to protect the land. That land has a sufficient value that makes it worth protecting. That may stop or only slow down erosion, <clears throat> but defences have a design life, defences are there, they are seen to be solid, therefore the houses are safe. But those defences have implications. They modify the sediment budget. They change how processes operate on that process, and that may well cause problems elsewhere. So, even a coastal defence, you may stop a problem, but you can very easily generate another one. From the human side, even though the coast is eroding, it doesn't necessarily prevent people investing in that coastline. Human perception, poor risk awareness, causes ignorance to the problem. And ironically, if property maintains its value and the area is seen to be nice and in demand, this may even lead to further development, and quite commonly when major defences are built, the perceived value of that land increases and more houses are built, thus making the problem bigger in the future. So ultimately, we could drive a problem of increasing house building. Unlikely in this area, but the scenario can be applied elsewhere. But this issue about denial, about seeing a defence, makes people feel safe. One of the women interviewed even said, I can see there's a defence there. I know we've been told there are only 50s. I don't believe it's going to happen. I believe they will maintain it in, in perpetuity, but that's clearly not the case. OK, it's been nice talking to you. We'll leave it there and we can have a question and answer session at a later time if you wish. So thank you for listening and hopefully if you've got any questions, we can speak again soon. <laughs>